capture my desktop and upload this whole thing to the internet. So if you miss something when one of these split second 15 key combo presses I do, you'll be able to check it out there in slow motion. But for now, I'm going to open up a cool little presentation document that I made just for you guys called Vive Talk and talk about the Vive. So I am Paul Eckhart. You can follow me on Twitter as Puzzlebug. You can check out my website, BrickLightStudios.com. I just migrated <laughs> servers yesterday for whatever reason. I thought that was a good idea. And they replaced all of my index files with one index file, so people nice. were really confused and I was confused because it was still like cached on one of my servers and anyways it's back up there is a link right here vive links bit.ly slash vive links that's going to have a PDF with all the links in the entire presentation right there so you can download that whenever you feel like and click all the links that I'm going to be showing you that you can't click because they're on a big old screen here so as none of you know, I started with room scale motion control games back in the 1900s. Technology back then wasn't quite as good. We used an overhead projector and transparencies where we drew out the enemies and power-ups and had one brother running the game, one brother running the power-ups, and one brother playing it. My fourth brother was too small, so he had to be kept out of the room during these fantastic gaming sessions. There I am collecting a power-up. Uh, there's one of the more dangerous levels. You could die here. Uh, as you would jump, we would actually adjust the vertical level of the level. So you would pretty much stay in one spot, and then we'd, we'd set it up, and it side-scrolled. It was fantastic. And there were killer enemies like this. I have no idea what this is. Then in 2012, the year the world ended, it was actually going to end because tofu was flying out of this dark alley somewhere. And if you were to take baseball bats and knock it back down the alley, you'd save the world. So I did this enough times to avert the whole Mayan apocalypse thing using a Razor Hydra motion control thing. So then this year rolls around and Valve said, hey, if you're a qualified developer slash game studio that can make a game for us for our Vive that will come out when the Vive launches, we'll give you a dev kit. So I signed up for that and heard nothing because I'm not really a development studio, I kind of just did that as a hobby. But then somebody's like, well, you should email them all your games that you've made. And I was like, well, I did that the first time. But I did it the second time. I was like, eight reasons to send me a vibe. Number seven is about couches. And they were like, whoa, couches. So they sent me a vibe. <laughs> and trust me, the couch thing, it's beyond amazing. Uh, I might have a little title in here about that. But first, I want to talk to you about beach balls. One of the games that I was just going to do as a test and throw away involved hitting beach balls with pizza paddles on a castle wall in a very sunny green world. I let some people play it, and everybody liked it way too much. So I was like, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to put it on Steam. So starting April, sometime before the Vive launches, hopefully, you'll be able to pick this up on Steam in early access and tell me if you want the beach balls bigger or smaller, if you want more beach balls, <laughs> if you want less beach balls, if you really don't like the storms that clean up the beach balls to keep you from spawning enough beach balls to drop your frame rates, that sort of info, or if I should make mini games or whatever. So kind of a work in progress, but too many people have too much fun. Even myself, I play hardcore games. I have a friend that plays hardcore games. I was like, you should try this. He's like, yeah, I don't really think so. But 2,300 beach balls later, he was sold. <laughs> How do you hit, what do you do with the beach balls? Uh, you hit the beach balls with pizza petals. Imagine you have 500 beach balls. It's, a, it's something that just makes people happy. Imagine you can actually flip them with pizza petals. Again, we use carbon fiber pizza petals in the game. Uh, there's a wood veneer over them, so they look like they're wood, but they're not wood. But people, when you're in VR, you don't notice. What's the title? Uh, the title of this game is going to be Beach Ball Valley. Kind of rhymes with Tofu Alley. It's, a, it's my thing. Um, secret little teaser coming out on April 1st, a game called Space Couch, reason number seven for me getting the vibe. Trust me, it's, it's cooler than this logo, <laughs> which is pretty cool. I like the, the lens face. 
Not too many lens flares though, but just enough. All right, so here's the game plan. I'm gonna talk about room scale, talk about Unreal. If you don't know game development or anything, it might be a little bit boring. You might think I'm a wizard. Just sit back and pretend you're in some weird culture of gaming development and enjoy the show and ritual dances I'm gonna do as the game doesn't work. I'm gonna actually build a scene, talk about performance, and then talk about these things, whatever the heck they are. Uh, but first, some bonus lighthouse tips. These here are lighthouses standing up on the top of these stands. If you look down at the base, I don't know if you can see that way in the back, but there's an electrical cable wrapped around the base. If I were to trip on that cable, it would pull by the base instead of pulling up at the top, and it wouldn't torque the thing over. It's a cool video tip that prevents lights from falling into actors when other people are running through the set. Highly recommended. Also, if you're around a lot of people, like I should have done tonight, but I didn't want to bring them in, get some sandbags and throw them on there, and it'll give you a lot of peace of mind. And they're really light, so even a small sandbag will keep this really stable. If you're putting these in your house and you put them on your ceiling, maybe you're in an apartment, sometimes ceilings aren't as stable as you'd like, and somebody upstairs bowling or playing basketball or just walking around will move the lighthouses and they'll shake and your whole world will start moving and you'll be upset. Well, yes? Do you ever notice with these tripods if you step close to it, does that shake in this? Get That's it? actually the next point. If you're on carpet or on a floor above somebody else and you're running around, these can inherit some of the movement from the floor and start to shake and again it can break your world. If somebody were to bump one of those while I'm in the demo, again it breaks the world. If somebody else is in the demo and somebody bumps one of those, it breaks the world and I don't know it and they come out totally seasick and I'm like, I don't know what's wrong. Everybody else has been just fine and then I look and it's been moved a centimeter to the left. <laughs> so make sure they stay in the same spot. <laughs> Screw them into your walls. Build giant iron I-beam pilings. Do whatever it takes. And don't put them on a desk that somebody's like playing video games at because again the desk will move just a little bit but it does it. Um, Sync. Right now these are wirelessly sync. Keep in mind that one of them has to be B and one of them has to be C for the wireless sync. Not A and B, not C and C, not matching, but B and C is wireless. And then A and B, if you use the wire, which is just an eighth inch audio cable, tells you that in the manual, but I told you here so I can tell you so later when you're like, they're not connecting. So that is your lighthouse tips. Any quick questions about lighthouses? Will any of this stuff change? Right now, they're not actually wired to the computer at all. I think they might be talking via Bluetooth to one of the Bluetooth breakout boxes. And just that, all that is for is to tell the computer if the firmware is updated and what the number, or the serial number of the lighthouse is. Uh, where should the lighthouses be placed relative to your actual capture space? I give you tips on that. The more space, the merrier, generally. I try to avoid shadowing objects, like if there's going to be a bunch of people walking through the side of the room, skip it. Like right here, to the middle of my room here, I could walk out and I wouldn't shadow a player who's in the center of the room. So just focus on having this, them set up so that people can congregate in one area and have your computer in the other area over here and then have those facing in towards the middle. Is there anything in particular that interferes with them, like any sort of... Reflections or stuff? They've actually fixed the reflection bug, so people have had to move mirrors or change stuff up, now that's fixed. I have no idea how they fixed it. I can't even start to begin to say, well, here's how you would know it's a reflection. I don't, I don't know, magic. How do you, how do you decide how much to tilt them? I had trouble figuring out. I usually different. try to aim them for my head because that's where my head tracked device is going to be, so it's like a 35 to 45 degree tilt facing downwards towards the center of the room. Now they do have a 120 degree spread, so these towers are now tracking just about down to their bases and up into the ceiling here. So they give you a really big, really generous field of view if you don't set them up right. What's your maximum distance from your experience that you could have from one another? I've had them maybe 23 feet apart without any trouble. I tried to set them up 
outside once and had tons of issues and I'm not sure why, but I maybe have been 50 feet apart was a little too much. Uh, presently there's two, is there any implementation? Yes, in the future they're thinking about throwing in options for more of them, it's just a changing the sync pulses and somehow getting them to talk to each other if they can't see each other. And if you've got more than two, you can't just use one sync cable. Can you theoretically use one if you... Yes. Yeah, if you're facing it the whole time. If you were to take the sync cable and not plug it all the way into the back of one, and it tells you your sync cable isn't plugged all the way in, but you don't believe it, it'll just run on one. <laughs> yes. Or you just don't turn one on, and it works. So you could have this set up on a desktop. You could have them set up on the floor. The height is better because it will get to your head through the air easier than it gets to your head through your body. All right, here is one of my super cool ways you can mount a lighthouse. If you can strap them onto objects, they don't move, they can't be touched, they can't trip people, and they stay there solidly. And you also get more play space because you don't have to worry about running into tripods. Nobody cares if you had a concrete pillar. The world still works. So room scale. There's the chaperone system. How many people know about the chaperone system? Uh, basically, it's a laser grid that shows up that I draw out every time I set up the room. And when you walk close to it or move your hands close to it, it shows up and tells you, here is the last bastion of safety beyond this line. No man can guarantee your life will not be forfeit. It doesn't say that, but it should probably say that in text <laughs> or in your voice when you get too close. There is no chaperone on the ceiling as of yet. You can put that in your own games where you can calibrate the ceiling so people, when they reach up, it blacks out and they learn not to reach up so they don't hit your ceiling because tall people like myself have been known to hit ceilings in certain action games or painting games where you just need that extra height. And yeah. Uh, there is a thing called Tron mode which was sort of demoed and then some people kind of figured out how to do it on the internet. It lets you see through the camera in the front of live. There's a tiny camera there. And it actually lets you see everything outside in the real world. But it's only 2D. So once you walk up to the edge, it gives you this big old 2D view outside of the headset area, outside of the chaperone area. And if you were to close one eye, your brain will interpolate it all into 3D and it's amazing and you can actually interact with things. But as soon as you open both eyes with that on, everything is flat and weird and distorted. So impress your friends by telling them you can do anything with a chaperone and don't tell them you just close one eye to get the full 3D effect. Do you have it running on your setup today? I don't. I've been, I don't know if it disables the camera or if the camera just has some firmware issues right now. Yeah, so there's a secret way you unplug the USB and the HDMI and the power and they plug them back in in an order and then it will, if SteamVR is running when you plug them back in, then it will re-enable the camera on the next SteamVR run. <laughs> there's a little dance shown in the room scale setup that also helps get the camera working. Uh, the next topic is escape velocity. When you are playing a game and you are diving for a volleyball or something, you could dive right out of the chaperone and not be able to stop yourself. If you're making a game and you make it so people will want to do that, you are evil. <laughs> Don't do that. Like, honestly, the Kessel Beach Ball game I had, had beach balls that were just out there and people wanted to get them or people wanted to like run out there and grab them because it looks like it and the graphics look like it. And when I put the new graphics in, I saw the shepherd and I was like, no, that's just an illusion. I kept walking because I was there. So I've since adjusted it so you're down a little ways and the castle walls are slopes. So the beach balls will roll to you instead of egging you on to just go a little farther because you can almost get them. So don't jump through your chaperone. It's dangerous. <laughs> also, if you're playing with friends, everybody likes to test the chaperone and see, oh, is it really on the wall? Idiots, you can slap them if they try to test out the chaperone. Teach them while they're young. 
You can also make the chaperone a lot smaller so they will know that it's smaller and they have a little room, but then if they start using that room, then again, just electric shock something to let them know that it's not to be played with. Um, In-game positional recognition. With Unity and Unreal, you can know inside the game engine where the player's play space is. And you can give your players visual cues like a circle on the floor and a danger line and a little fence that says stay in here or you die. Or magic sparkles or something just to let people know here's where you can live in safety and here's where you can jump from here to here and be safe. Because without that, you completely lose your position in the world in relation to your real world. So give people a great idea of where they are and it's a whole lot more fun to be active in there. The final thing is practical haptics. How many people know about practical haptics? A few people. Put a big fuzzy rug on the middle of your floor. You know that's your safe spot. If you step off the rug, you know you're in danger. And after playing for a while, you will forget about the rug and you'll just automatically know you're safe when you're on the rug. Or know you need to step back when you're off of it. A lot of people say that movement is a problem in VR. It's really been solved a number of ways. I've put the full entire list. There are no ways beyond this yet. Saw them. Actually, there's a ton. No movement, just keeping the player in the room is actually really cool because then just walking around, you get all the movement just from your own agency. Teleporting is cool. Telefragging people is cool. I'm probably not officially announcing it yet, but there might be a game I'm working on where it's multiplayer and it's all about just telefragging people with different <laughs> telefrag moves. Um, you can do WASND. Some people can deal with that. Some people can mouse and keyboard their way through VR. A lot of people can't. I would recommend just making stuff for all the people instead of just the people who are lucky enough to not get motion sick. Uh, there's the fast zoom method where it's kind of like a teleport, but you just zoom through the world really quick. Once you go fast enough, your body doesn't perceive it as motion and it just works. Uh, portals, obvious. There's a thing here called flipping where you could walk to a side. It flips and then you would walk back to continue walking in the straight direction in your game. So in real life, you're walking like this, but in the game, you just keep going straight. Uh, board game mechanic is give players little areas the size of the room where they can jump to or teleport to or roll the die and get to move that many areas forward. And then in that area, they're free to walk around. The mini dude mode is you have a little tiny dude where you drive him around or you unpossess your spirit and float above his head and you can drive him around and just watch him and then jump back in and play his first person. Monitor mode is what we were demoing in that eagle flying thing. You basically shrink down the field of view, and then players can do ridiculous stuff that they could on a regular monitor because nobody seems to care when your entire field of view is not taken up by this super immersive, tilting, falling sensation. Funny thing, with 3D projectors, you get all the same problems as VR sickness if it's in enough of your peripheral view. So I've been experimenting with that for quite some time. And if you play Portal and you go through the wall and then you go through the ceiling, you lose it. And it's not. I've gotten really close. And I'm now it's like, just 30 seconds more and I would be all over the floor. <laughs> However, every time you hear the Portal 2 music now, I start to get sick. It's like, <laughs> oh, the memories, no, no. Um, the final one I've got here is pulling the universe, where you literally grab and pull, and as you pull, I'm just imagining myself rushing into these tables up front, but you can basically pull yourself through the world. And that works for a lot of people, especially if you show some sort of grid or reference plane as to this is stopped and the world is moving. It works really good. Even Unreal is doing it in their VR editor. Speaking of Unreal Engine, make sure you're going to grab some water here and you can take a 30 second break to think about how you would move in VR. <laughs> yes. People have gotten killed in hover junkers though, with guns.
All right. How many people here have used Unreal Engine? It's a pretty good amount. How many people have used Unity? That's actually about equal, which is interesting. They're both really cool engines. They both make games, and people have had fun playing games made in Unity and Unreal, more so with Unreal games, but I'm not biased. <laughs> uh, I picked up Unreal for a bunch of reasons a long time ago when the playing field was totally different. Now Unreal and Unity basically it's even a harder choice to make. So I'm just going to talk about Unreal and the cool stuff it does. It has instant stereo rendering. This gives you a 20, 10 to 20% performance boost. Finally actually implemented in the engine. They just had the checkbox to say it was implemented, but it really wasn't working till yesterday. So that's super cool. Motion controller is integrated. You throw in the motion controller element and it works for the Rift, the PlayStation VR, and the Vive. And a guy has a plug-in to run it with the Hydra. The Leap Motion doesn't work as a motion controller, but that's also built in there. It has physics. Unity has physics. It's NVIDIA's physics. Just their whole physics layer. It's great. It works. It's got a lot of features. It does a lot of stuff that you need to do. It has a couple little funky errors that you'll run into, almost guaranteed, but you can work your way around them. Right now it has DirectX 12 and Vulkan support. Don't ask me how to get Vulkan support working. If you're super pro, you can do that. It's a great thing. It makes stuff run faster, and you can have more stuff in your scenes overall. It has a node-based, physically-based render material editor. It's a lot like Maya's Hypershade. I like it a lot. It's a lot like Blender's Cycles material editor. So it feels more at home for me personally to just be dragging and dropping pieces of materials. It's got a ton of different nodes. It doesn't have one that I want, but <laughs> it's got some stuff that's close, so it pretty much works for everything. On the coding side, it has C++ as its language. It's got a thing called Skookum Script, which is a plugin, but it's a really high-level scripting language. If you like scripting instead of really doing programming, it does a lot of cool stuff, and I think it's a free plugin, so check it out. It's got a dumb name, but it's a cool plugins, uh, kind of a trade-off. It's also got Blueprints, which is a node-based logic editor for almost everything you can do in the engine. Not really, though. There's things that I'm like doing Blueprints. I'm like, well, this needs to be in programming. But those are the complicated things. For the most part, you don't ever need to leave Blueprints unless you're cool and you know C++ and you're a real programmer, unlike me. Um, the Blueprints debugger, I might show you a little bit about that, but you run the game and all these little nodes that chain together shows the flow of how the gameplay is working, how the logic is functioning while you're running the game, and it's super cool to look at. Even if you're not using it, you can just impress people by, look, I click this button and this path lights up, and then this path lights up, and it's, it's also going to be in VR, so you're going to be able to check it out in VR and just see these glowing noodles and boxes. Uh, there's the thing called the gameplay framework. Unreal has all the pieces you need to put a game together in their Unreal sort of way. Matchmaking. Oh, there's an MN stereo meeting. Check it out, it's at East Lake Library. All right, so the gameplay framework, it's really cool. It's got all the features if you want to use them. It also has networking support built right in so you're working with Unreal Engine instead of in Unity where you'd be working with one of the plugins. So it's really well supported. I haven't used it yet, but I really want to because telefragging wizards, what can I say? There's also a ton of tutorials which can be accessed starting with the Unreal launcher over here. And there's quiet mode for everything else. So this is the Unreal Launcher. It has random news, a marketplace, and it's got a bunch of tutorials here. And you could click on them if you weren't just doing a cool talk on the Vive. But there's a lot of content. There's a lot of pre-built scenes you can download and pick apart and build your own game on. So are there multiplayer Vive users in separate facilities that are in Yes. 
I have been. So the data is shared. Yep. Over the network. Yep. Uh, so right now, Hover Junkers is kind of the main multiplayer Vive game, but there's other multiplayer Vive games that let you interact with each other. It's a whole new world of trolling. <laughs> Provided the programmer put that in, yes. <laughs> it's up to the programmer to do that. So I'm actually going to put together a new game here. I believe that's next on the list. I'm certain there's a way to make a new game in this. Paul, that list of features is amazing, but how can I afford it? Well, <laughs> Unreal Engine has moved to a free model, which is a sort of free model. It used to be super tons of money, and then it was like 20 bucks a month, and then they moved it to free. The only time you pay is if you are making a game for profit, except an arcade game or like a roller coaster. If you're doing like architectural visualization or rendering sports cars for a multi-million dollar sports car company, it's free. But if you're selling a game and you make more than $3,000 on that title, gross, not net. So Steam sales are like, oh, you made $3,001 and Epic wants 5% of that 3000 bucks per quarter. Which is okay with me because I think Epic is cool and I want to support them. Is, so, is that the only way you can distribute <coughs> games for the volume is through Steam? Nope. You can do anything you want. Anything at all. Well, within reason. <laughs> but it's 150 bucks once. It's free. I'm, I'm, I mean, the 150 bucks for when you, when you sell a game, you do the 3000 you give the 150 and never ask for money again. Um, it's quarterly. If you make $3,000 and $1 every quarter, then you're paying the, oh. the 5% on that. If you want, if you've got a game that you think will make a different amount of money and you want to make a different amount of money and you think you can work out a deal with them, you're free to contact them and say, Yo, I want to pay you 200 bucks up front for no royalties lifetime on the game. And they'll be like, well, yes or no. I haven't tried that. Uh, before I get into Unreal, though, there's a couple more things I want to talk about coming soon. And by soon, I mean what, this June or sooner. Totally in VR editor for Unreal where you can get in there and put things in your world with your hands in a Vive. It looks super cool. I haven't built it yet because I've been super busy, but it looks like it'll be amazing. Support for HDR display, so if you have a 10-bit display, you'll be able to play games in Unreal on a 10-bit display. And that would apparently work for the next generation of HMBs, which will probably have an HDR display. There's going to be a blueprint to C++ conversion tool, so you can start out in blueprints and roll into C++ once you're happy with it. Right now you can make something in C++ and put it into blueprints. So there's a lot of interoperability there. Multi-res rendering apparently has 10 to 20% frame savings. Multi-GPU using AMD's Liquid VR or an NVIDIA Gameworks is being investigated and putting in there as soon as they can. And they're doing a full audio system rewrite, which will hopefully have nicer audio for VR. Currently you can use the Rift audio plugin for binaural audio and all this cool stuff the Rift audio plugin does. That's in there when you download the engine. There is cool hyperlink to click here. This is the roadmap for Unreal and this is going to be in that PDF with all the clickable links. This actually lets you check out exactly where the engine is heading along all these categories. So you can see in VR the next thing they're working on is documentation and learning set to roll in on March. And multi-res rendering and all these other things. So you can jump in and vote and comment on what you need for your game and they actually respond to that. And there's the audio system which has been the only thing they're doing in the audio section until June. So it's super handy and open to see where they're heading with their game engine and lets you complain if you don't like what they're doing or if you've got a great new feature they should put in. 
a uh, couple things that are coming later. These are all in NVIDIA Gameworks. So there's the whole NVIDIA versus ATI controversy, which is basically the NVIDIA has stuff that runs better on NVIDIA cards and is kind of broken on ATI cards. However, these features are super cool. And I've got to show you. There's a universal physics solver, which runs everything with tiny little springs and joints, which means that you can have squishy bacon. <laughs> right now, these paddles aren't set up using the universal solver, so they're kind of clipping through. But once everything is using that universal solver, it's seamless, or at least there's no occlusion. It, it tastes great, by the way. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about how many hours I may have spent with bacon. There's also a fluid solver. So when this is rendered with a different shader, which isn't quite working in VR yet, it'll actually render a water surface on top of all these little globs. But for now, I experimented with ball pits up to about that high, at which point I drowned. It was a, it's quite the experience. Have you experienced any this? this one is running at 90 frames a second, 10,000 simulated balls in the ball pit were not, but I didn't realize it because I was having too much fun. And it, it was later, I was like, wait, was that really running at 90 frames? I was like, no, that's actually running around 40 frames a second. <laughs> but it's worth it. <laughs> VXGI, how many people know about that? It's basically global illumination based on lights real time in your scene, which means that if I have a candle in a room, it'll light up the room, it'll bounce off the wall, and it'll light up the other wall. If I have a spotlight and I shine it on one spot in the floor of the room, it won't stop there, it will bounce and light up the whole room. It's incredibly cool looking. It probably takes a ton of GPU performance, so I'm not totally sold on it for VR, but I do want to put it in there. It's on the link sheet, so you can check out all these texts. That's all real-time runtime. Yep, that's all real-time. So there's no more light baking. There's like, you can have a completely dynamic scene where you're playing with beach balls, and the sun comes up, and the sun goes down, and the fireflies come out, and the beach balls light up, because they do that, and they illuminate the castle. Who's, who's doing it? Is, it, is that a... This is with NVIDIA again. That's the NVIDIA. So it might have started out as somebody else, and NVIDIA was like, I want that to just run on NVIDIA cards. Right. So with... Uh, Vulcan and with DirectX 12 some of this stuff might run a lot better with AMD cards. I'm not sure we have yet to see. I'm hoping it does because it's really cool tech. But with the improvements in the instant stereo, you would think at some point you could start to bring in some of these costly GPU features. Yep, yep. Um, and you've got, we'll get to that <laughs> more about performance, but the last thing that is coming in June in the official editor is editing pretty much anything in VR, which includes a material editor, the node editor, whatever makes sense to do in VR is going to be in there, which means once you want to edit a game, it's not going to be this, put it on, do something for a second, take it off, tweak it, put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off. How many people have done that? About as many people who had headsets. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Uh, a couple things that are not in Unreal Engine. There's a drag and drop prefab that's in Unity. It's really cool for just the drag and drop prefab. After that, there's, it gets a little more complicated with coding it to your personal tastes. Spectator camera support in Unreal is gimped in comparison with Unity. You just get this single eye rendered in tall screen, I guess. Vertical video syndrome all over there. It's not cool. I don't know if they're going to fix it or not but Unreal isn't the spectator-friendly VR version. And Valve is putting a lot of work into Unity right now to make sure it's great for making games. And they've got all sorts of cool camera features for these spectator cameras. Uh, the robot repair demo, I don't know if it was made in Unity or the Source Engine, but the tech that they've got in it, which we talked about a little bit earlier, the scalability, the per frame scalability settings are going to be a free plugin for Unity. And that's super cool. As far as Unreal getting that, I'm not sure. Unreal might already do some of that stuff, but we will see. It does make Unity look a little more interesting, and 
does a lot of cool stuff with lighting. So check that out if you're using Unity. Yes? Yeah, uh, Robot Repair was a major source <coughs> to it. It was? It was. Okay. Don't listen to the internet. <laughs> I don't quote the internet. Listen all you want. All right, so now we're going to jump into Unreal and make a super cool game. We're going to call it, do we, anybody have an idea for what we're going to make? What was that? Somebody said Dino Madness. I like that. <laughs> All right. So here is the Unreal Editor. We're going to make a new project. Some of this might get really technical. If it does, close your ears and I'll wave like this when we're done with the technical parts. Vive Chalk. Killer Dino Madness. I'm going to set it to scalable 2D and 3D with no starter content as a blank game that's a blueprint game because I'm not dealing with C++, not today. I'm excited for this game already. <laughs> All right, so here's our basic setup. We're going to go through putting a pawn in, making a player controller, making a game mode, setting up the floor spawn point, adding the spawn objects functionality, putting a listener and a head collider in there. Then we're going to do some setup in the world. Then we're going to set up the motion controllers. And then we're going to talk about performance. So here we go. This is usually not the resolution I run Unreal at, but it looks better on the projector. new folder. So the player pawn is like a game piece. That's what the player can control. You can control any number of pawns, but this is going to be the Vive pawn. With the Vive pawn, the base camera height is 64, which would let you jump into the world and see things from about the average player eye height. With the Vive, it's going to run off 0, 0, 0 in world coordinates. So you have to start that as 0, otherwise you're going to start your head up about there and it's going to be awkward. And this is Dino Simulator, not Giraffe Simulator. Unlike Unity, Unreal likes to have tons of tabs with all your different objects and different tabs. Uh, player controller. I am the player controller. This is just kind of a representation of me. So if my pawn dies, the player controller remains and stays in the game. And a game mode. And the player controller is not the handheld. It's, it's kind of an abstract idea that there's a player who is controlling stuff versus an AI controlling stuff. So this is the game mode, and the game mode lets us choose the Vive Pawn and the Vive Controller. Now if that would have been a regular player controller, you'd have WASD and mouse movement. I don't want that. And if you do, you're going to have to make your own game. So if I hit play here, oh look, exactly what I said. It wasn't going to happen, happen, because you've got to set it to play in VR. Uh, it looks like the mouse is still rolling in there. Probably because I didn't set the game mode in the world settings. So, pro tip. <laughs> so that's actually tracking now. Um, I, would have, I would have somebody be my assistant and do all the in-game stuff, except that when you close the game, it flashes the stereo last frame that was played in there every now and then. It makes people super sick, so we're not going to do that. You're not missing out, trust me. So if I hit play again, you'll notice that is not on the floor in the world. So I've got to set this down to where the actual floor is. The floor happens to be about 20 units above there. And now you can't see the floor because it's in the floor.
So it might actually it might be a little too low. So we'll go back to 22. And before I run into another error, I'm going to save the map. This is using SteamVR. SteamVR doesn't have to be running through Steam. If I start SteamVR now, it will crash because they're both trying to use SteamVR and they don't get along very well. I could close it and start up SteamVR, but it's usually just fine running without Steam or SteamVR open. Do you have to install any plugins or anything to get to This is devices? right out of the box. Oh. So I haven't changed anything, which is fantastic because Plugins usually tend to not work when you want them to, and that's usually what happens. So right now, when the actor is spawning, we've got this thing called the spawn collision handling method, and I'm going to set it to always spawn and ignore collisions. If it does not always spawn, you do not always spawn, and you get into a large number of weird errors. Sometimes if the hand controllers are off the floor, they will spawn the hands. Sometimes if they're not off the floor, you get no hands in the game. So this is a crucial component for having hands, which is the next thing that I'm going to do, is that we need some cool hands, except not in this game. This game is going to be a dino game. So I prepared some dinosaur heads, which is going to be able to modify it like that. I'm going to run these through a thing called Unreal 4 Tools. There's a link in the links page for that. But I've got these guys selected. I'm going to check Pivot to Center for secret purposes and hit Export. And now over here, I should be able to import those right into the game. No textures in Blender. You can do all that anymore. I'm not going to do any textures. Good catch, though. You could set up the textures and the UV mapping in Blender. That's a great idea. But now they even have fantastic names, Cube Zero and Cube One. <laughs> Auto-generate collision, sure thing, bring them in. But then if you did, you textured them in Blender Base and then text them. Yep, yep. So here's, wow, phenomenal. So you can already see that Vive games in VR are already just a step above your ordinary game where you don't have dinosaurs for hands. <laughs> so I'm going to set up some dinosaurs for hands here. Motion controller built right into the game, so this is going to be our left dinosaur. Control W is duplicated in here. And for the right one, the only thing we have to change is set this to right. And compile. And if I hit play, nothing's going to happen because these hands don't render in game. You have to put a dinosaur on the hand to be able to render it appropriately. Static mesh. Oh, look, it already had that selected. There's one for the left hand. There's one for the right hand. This is the lower jaw. Once you have the headset on, you cannot see your body because it's not trapped. So you can't see yourself with the headset on. But I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, in VR edit mode, you see yourself going through all these dialogues and typing. And I am not sure exactly. Maybe. I mean, if you have a VR keyboard that you can see. That VR mode to be this, isn't, this isn't something that I've said to myself, man, I wish I could set up a character's hierarchy in VR. That would just make my day. <laughs> The, the VR edit mode is really fatiguing. I mean, you're constantly bending your wrist in and pointing at your hands and doing yeah, all the movements. It's more for like placing decorative elements and things that you would fine tuning, right? Yeah, it's fine tuning. So here is what appears to be dinosaurs for hands. Let's see if this works. I'm going to turn these controllers on. Pro tip. Having your controllers on is a good thing. Did you lock the rotation to one? 
I have not yet done that. Now they're not going to move or anything, but we're going to get to that in just a moment. There are no dinosaurs for hands yet. So I'm going to actually jump to this start point. And I'm going to say, always spawn, ignore collisions, because that might actually be the problem. Nope. And it looks like I the brilliant fellow have attached dinosaur hands to the game mode, not the player character. <laughs> Boom. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to check this out on the headset. I'm not going to talk into the microphone right now. And they're not moving. <laughs> wow, this is going to be a lot bigger and scarier than I expected. <laughs> so let's see why these motion controllers aren't moving. This one is the right. This one is the left. Are they not parented? I think they are parented. The meshes, those meshes are parented. And now those meshes are parented. It looks like it didn't copy the hierarchy when I copied it over there. Now it did, for sure. All right. But we do have dinosaurs for hands, so who really cares? <laughs> Just a quick restart fixes that player character tilt offset. Don't try to move your mouse around, apparently. So on the actual controllers themselves, is there like a left and a right? A cause the left and the right get assigned by a lottery system. One in valve every time you turn them on, there's a little coin flip and left and right get set up. Okay. Is it like that budget that's game, doesn't it have you assign at the beginning which hand you want to do what or something? It might. I mean that's something you can do. You can say this is my left and this is my right hand. Yeah. Or you can like swap the controllers to pick which you want to be which. Some of the games detect it when they start up while you're holding them. And other ones will let you be ambidextrous. So right now the dinosaurs are pointing <laughs> the wrong way. Oh X God. plus is the forward direction. And right now I have them on Y plus. So apply the rotation scale. We could actually just scale them down in Blender because right now it looks like they are meters long. Uh, get those guys selected and hit export. Jump back to Unreal Engine and just re-import those guys. Re-import. Save it. And if I hit play, they should be lined up appropriately now. And I have smaller dinosaurs for hands. Are 
They're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard to really tell people what dinosaurs for ants are like without them trying it. It's something I've never tried in my life, but it seems to be really good and it's something for multiplayer, definitely a multiplayer game right there. <laughs> dinosaurs, it can be a, most of your friends could probably be uh, they could be the herbivore dinosaurs, and the one guy in here could be the main hydra dinosaur monster, and yeah. So a couple other settings you can do with VR is the world to meters. So right now, I've got that set to 100, so it's one centimeter equals one centimeter. I set it to 1,000, and then if I were to play this, there would be tiny, tiny dinosaurs because now I'm a giant. Or I could set it to 10 or any, really any setting I want to. It scales off the world center instead of the player's head. So if you're scaling it, the player will feel like they're moving and it will upset the player. So make sure you offset by the player head to do that. That could be a bonus mode. You never know. <laughs> that sounds like a new game. DLC, dinosaur, expansion pack. <laughs> Something different kind of paddles as well. Canoe paddles. Dinosaur head paddles. Right. I like that thinking. All right. So I'm going to check what else we're going to do here. We're going to set up some default settings to secure proper performance. And then we're going to talk about the controllers and how the controllers work and get those dinosaurs biting things before we're done here. So over in this, we've got some interesting notes about performance, and then I'm going to implement all those. So it's running 2160 by 1200, half of that for each eye at 90 frames a second. That gives you about 11 milliseconds per frame, which is super, super short. That's a good and a bad thing, depending if you're the programmer or the player. If your game runs on the GTX 970, you can do all that, you're good. If it can't run on the 970, you're missing out on at least half your potential audience and people will be upset. I will be upset as well, even if I don't have to use the 970 to run a game. People have got the i7-2600K from however many years ago that came out to run at an 11 by using a 980 Ti or a 970 will get you way up into the good to go in the Steam VR test. So. Old CPUs are great. The AMD Phenom 2 1100T, which was the last AM3 CPU, does not cut it. Plays most of the games, but even with a modern GPU, it can't play some of the more modern ones. The AM3 Plus FX AMD CPUs have been hitting pretty high scores, so if you don't want to go Intel, like Rift told everybody Intel or Bust, you can grab one of the FX processors. Anti-aliasing. Unreal is giving you FXAA and TXAA. TXAA is temporal based, so if there's fast moving stuff, you're going to get funky motion artifacting, but if you're not moving, it's going to be super smooth and look really good. FXAA is learning almost everything in your scene, and it's not blurring it enough, so there is some aliasing issues, but it's a lot better than having no anti-aliasing at all. We're going to turn a bunch of things off that take a lot of power to run and then we're going to throw in an unbounded post-process volume, which basically means we can turn even more things off locally or globally because it's unbounded. You could, if you wanted to test it, put a bunch of post-process volumes and look at your scene in one and then drag the next one onto your head and see, oh, look, here's anti-aliasing, and then here's this, and here's ambient occlusion, and see what effects are really destroying your game in real time using the motion controllers, which makes it all more important and <coughs> futuristic. Um, performance wise there are some really good resources on Unreal on the internet which they've uploaded there based on their demos that they've done check those out again they're in the link sheet and ultimately do whatever you want as long as it runs in the 970 if you want ambient inclusion if you need VXGI get those in your game but make sure it runs there's a lot of tweaking involved and there's very little opportunity to 
Would mess you up. Your red level has the, the, the lowest as yeah. like the recommended. You want somebody who's yeah. thrown two grand to into a system to be able to run your game well, not be like, oh, I need to throw another 300 bucks on a better video card. So I'm now going to set up those settings here. In the future, there's going to be a default project that will have all this stuff set up. So ignore these if you're just going to wait for the future. Project settings, general settings, frame rate cap is disabled. Rendering settings, we're going to disable ambient occlusion. Put the anti-alias on FXAA. And we could turn on instant stereo here, but like I said before, it's not going to work in this version, <laughs> so ignore that. So Save it. What is instant stereo? Yeah. Instant stereo is a small trick where it saves a lot of render time. One weird way your local police don't want you to find out about. Okay. Look it up on the internet. It's more complicated than I can describe here, but it's really great. Is that something that's unique to uh, this editor, or is like is that like a BRY technique? It's a GPU technique. So the instant thing what you're doing is you're leaving uh, like your vertex arrays and everything resident on the GPU. You're not picking them every single frame, right? So you're saving all that time. So in stereo, instant thing, or like Unity's calling it double wide rendering. Uh, you pipe all your arrays once to the GPU and then render twice, so you're not doing a double for each So you save a lot. So like it depends on what we are. So you're still coming up with pixels, but you're not keeping the, all the geometry and normal. Yes. Bloom looks good. I always leave Bloom on. All right, so there's a bunch of these settings that I've ticked off. Again, it'll tell you there on the website which ones you can tick off. And if you need some of these, like in the beach ball game, screen space reflection, it costs me about three milliseconds. But it's worth it because you can see your reflection in the beach balls and the beach balls reflect other beach balls. And the giant kingly beach balls will reflect the castle as they roll over and crush you. Or not. That's whether you've got paddles. You can fight for your life. <laughs> so now that all that's set, it will run, but I've got one more setting here, which is this latest casting shadows. Shadows are inherently super complicated and generally are going to remain off if you want it to run on a decent graphics card. So now this is running at 90 frames a second. I would imagine I'm going to check it out and see how those dinosaurs feel now without shadows. Super smooth. So the shadowing did look cool in there, so it's possible that I might want to drop down some of the other settings to get shadows back for this dyno mode view. So it's something you want to think about, and there is a great way to figure out, which is the profiler, control, shift, comma. Here is the, uh, here's the GPU profiler, and this tells me exactly what took what amount of time in the frame. So right now it looks like the total time is about 5.21 milliseconds, which is great. Just to do a little demo of this, I'm gonna turn the lighting on. I'm gonna try to find the lights. There's the lights running in at 0.46. So now I'm gonna turn cast shadows on. Remember that number, hit play. And now the lighting is coming in at 1.3 milliseconds. So we've almost tripled the lighting just by turning shadows on. And this is super simple geometry to start with. Like, these are just Stone Age dinosaurs. This is not like a robot mech dinosaur, which would cost infinitely more. Anyways, you can use this to drill down and see what's taking the most of your frame time. And right now it looks like we don't have instance rendering, so it's rendering view one and view two separately here. And that's costing us a decent chunk. You, you can actually see both of the views laid down up here. In instance rendering, that would probably look like less of a duplicate. Um, 
So there's lots and lots of stats. I'm not going to really get into that. If you've got something that's chewing up your game, search it on the internet and somebody will have found a solution for you. This is not VR specific. This is just general gaming stuff. It's just that now you have a lot less time before you're running into issues. So that is the profiler. There's also a CPU profiler that gets even more complicated. Generally in VR, you're going to be worrying about your graphics far before your CPU is starting to tie things up. You can check that out on the internet. Um, I'm going to check my time. It's about 8.30, which means it's time to get some motion controller action and snapping dinosaurs. If those of you in the front row want to move a little back for this part, there. Those dino heads are still really big. They might not look like it out here, but... All right, five motion controllers. There are four face buttons. You can access those face buttons right in the blueprints. I'll show you that in a moment, but one, two, three, four are just clickable. You can assign those. You don't have to do any crazy touchpad stuff, which deals with this touchpad. Um, it's called the trackpad is called a thumbstick. Unreal calls it a thumbstick. Everybody needs your own name for it. Come up with your name now and tell people that's what it's really called. So anyways, the thumb dial returns zero, zero when it's untouched. So you can always check and say, oh, if it's zero, zero, then we're not touching it. You've got X negative one to plus one, Y negative one to positive one. And that gives you your positioning on the thumb pad. So you can make that like hundreds of buttons that are really hard to press or a couple buttons that are easier, dials or whatever you want. Do crazy math on it. Do polar to rectangular stuff. And I don't know, maybe a little fishing game where you dial stuff or a rotary telephone simulator. It's, I think it's a great feature. There's also a touch keypad like the Steam controller has in VR and they've updated it so once you go to the touch keypad it doesn't freeze your VR game, which is a great feature. <laughs> There's the shoulder button. It's actually the app button or the menu button, but it's called the shoulder button on Unreal. Um, it's a great button. Usually people are using it to teleport or to open up a menu. Right now, all the games are using these controls differently and it's kind of ridiculous because some people are putting a menu on the grip buttons and some people are teleporting on the t trackpad button. Uh, the grips. There are two grips, but they're one button. So that's the way it's ambidextrous. There's a trigger. It moves from 0 to 0.95, and then it clicks from 0.95 to 1. The trigger is going to fire every tick of the game. It's going to check where the trigger is at. So you can also have a trigger just by default as a trigger, and if it goes past the trigger threshold that's set somewhere in Unreal settings, then it'll fire the trigger event. You cannot use the Steam menu button that's the button below the touchpad. I didn't show you that button. It just opens up the Steam overlay. There's also a button right here on the headset that does the same exact thing. So you've got three buttons for the same purpose. Great. <laughs> also, in the previous controllers, people were hitting that by accident, and they switched it to have one button up here and one button down here. This is still the menu button, and people are still hitting it by accident. I don't know why. We'll see what happens with the next revision. Maybe there will be like little button covers that you have to flip open to hit the menu button. <laughs> All right. These are motion tracking devices, so they track their motion, which means you can get all sorts of stats, fuzz velocity, position, aim, and you can modify those with math. Like you could have a sine wave emanating from some point, so you can feel the bands of energy as you go toward a nuclear power core. Or you can make a little maze that you have to go through without hitting the buzzing walls and people could play this completely blind. You could have it pop based on a grid or based on distance. I have an effect where you stab a sword into the ground and it has this popping thing that kind of simulates the friction and the jumps that you'd have as you slide past rocks and the skulls of your enemies. <laughs> uh, proximity, you can get the distance to your head to these controllers, you can get like aiming at your head, there's like hundreds and hundreds of gestures you can do. Just go with the gestures that are easy to do, not the ones that you could do. Um, aiming wise, I've had it so you can aim at a certain point and it vibrates more when you're aiming towards that point. So you could have enemies that you could just aim behind your back and shoot them without even seeing them. You could have a multiplayer game where you're telefragging wizards where you can shoot people behind your back. Just saying. 
it's it's like a sixth sense. sense. I don't know what sense it would be. This, anyways, you can use that data to drive sound or haptics or particles or materials or like dragon heads or dinosaur heads, which we're about to do. So you can have it based on how fast you're going forward, like it opens up more or closes more, or you can just use the trigger because that seems like a great idea. We'll get back to this slide, it's important. So, Vive controller, it's not the one we want, we want the Vive pawn. We're gonna pull in a trigger event here. So I'm just gonna type in trigger motion controller left trigger axis. So this is gonna fire all the time. Here's the access value. Just to prove that that's working, I'm gonna do a print. And this is green because it's a float value. This is pink because it's a string. And it creates this little converter here which converts the float into a string for you. I'm gonna hit play and there's some zeros. It's just an analog trigger, so it's zero all the way to like 0 0.95 and then one when it clicks in. So that's the data we're going to be using to drive our dinosaur's lower jaw. So don't need to see that data. I'm going to do static mesh 01. I've forgotten, based on this great naming convention, which piece is which. Don't ask me why. Rotation. Set actor rotation. Static mesh one. <coughs> Great. I'm going to say this rotation. Uh, make rotator. This is going to be the roll. So that. Uh, this is going to drive a lerp, which is a linear interpolation between two values. So value, when we have the thing all the way pulled down, it's going to be open by like 45 degrees. It might be minus 45, we'll give that a try <laughs> first. Drop that into roll, so now roll is going in here. Pitch and yaw are staying at zero. That's probably a bad idea because now if I move my hand around, they're not going to rotate. So I'm going to get this guy's rotation. Get world rotation. Break rotator. Actually, we can just add these two together. Context sensitive. You cannot add rotators together. Pro tip. Is it combined? Do I want to multiply them though? I'm gonna I'm gonna do it the old-fashioned way. Break. And now we have all these little guys that we can throw that in there and that in there, and then these last two we're gonna add. Imagining you're working on a modern sized screen like 1920 by 1080, you'd be able to see a lot more stuff here and it would be fantastic. So float plus float, we're taking this funky new float, adding it with our old float, dragging it back in here, cooking spaghetti. We can also arrange these so they're a lot nicer, but who has time for that? We have dinos to operate. So that goes into, I think you're correct, is then that's going to be a problem. All right. Rolling. You do have it rolling. Rolling. Uh, 
horse terrifying that way. Dinosaur grill. That is that is truly amazing. So surprise rotating dinosaur jaws. Wow. Wow. You don't get these things unless you're in VR. Once you're in VR you're like, this makes sense now. <laughs> And seeing that none of you have played this game, you have no idea what it's like. <laughs> uh, that excuse is not going to work in about two to three weeks. But for now, I've been using it for everything. Um, it looks like we're using roll instead of pitch. It's kind of a problem. And we're also basing that off of adding these two together, which could also be a problem. So we're going to just do it without the math. Don't try this at home. We're also going to switch that to we're going to switch that to the other trigger because that's apparently the right dinosaur. So right trigger axis, drop that in, drop that in. There's probably a different node for adding a different type of rotation, but we're getting close to the end here. And it's always, it's super cool already, so who cares really. Dinosaur Jaw Dislocation 2016 <laughs> Simulator. I'm going to zip this whole project up and stick it on the internet if anyone even want to download this and fix it for me. I might fix it myself because it's, I already like the feel of that. So, that demonstrated. I think we have like one or two cool slides here. If Shift F5 were to start the presentation, oh, it's already going. Explore. Like you can see here, there's a ton of things to do. Don't just draw from old video games. Draw from anything. Art, pictures, music, dinosaur puppets that children have, dentist drills that's been... Anyways, just stay inside your chaperone. Thank you. Questions? We tried using a uh, display port instead of HDMI. I have difference. not. I've heard that it works. I've heard that HDMI is recommended. I've run it on a DVI to HDMI converter. That was originally recommended instead of the actual just straight into the HDMI port, but now that seems to be working. Also, USB 3.0 is working. So I'm guessing display port works too. There is a display port plug-in and the new dongles. Yep, yep. Like we're making a crossbow game, and if you pull the string back and you put it like right here where you would on a real crossbow, these things hit into each other. If you're trying to like grab a grenade or something, you're going to have issues. So you have to be creative as to how you design your game tech. Uh, can it detect more than one motion, I mean more than two motion controls? Yes. Three. The headset is connected to these two. These also pair with Steam controller USB Bluetooth dongles when they are flashed with the appropriate firmware. So, skills, canning, 
increase your VR capacity. Yes? So I wonder if it's to mess with the game world a little bit to make people feel like they're bringing them together even though they're not quite touching. Yes. How, how can you do that actually in a real engine or is it like... Yes. Okay. What we do is the crossbow instead of being straight across, the crossbow is like this. So you're like this uh, instead of this. And you don't realize it because you're getting shot at by a bunch of exploding crystals. Pro tip, if you have a semi-questionable game, just up the intensity. People will be <laughs> into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Thanks, Paul. So uh, we tr you can start packing up so we can clear right. out of here. And we traditionally go to the Red Cow, uh, which is just down the street, first in Washington. <laughs> How many people might be interested in doing that? Oh my gosh. Yeah, we'll begin a couple tables. Let's say whoever shows up first, tell them like, uh, I think I saw about 15 hands, 15, 20, something in that range. Let's say 15, and then we'll just smash in chairs from there. And um, anybody that's on a...